My first client as a professional counselor was a little girl named Marie. She was three and a half years old. She was nonverbal, hadn't spoken a word since she was picked up by Child Protective Services. Both she and her six-year-old sister were being treated for gonorrhea. This was my first professional client. Now, I can tell you folks that I was not interested in this being my lifelong journey. My plan was to get some practical counseling experience, then move into a PhD program for organizational psychology, where I could learn about how to help corporate America make more money, and myself, too. But Marie changed that. I was working as a volunteer for a sex, uh, Center Against Sexual Assault in Phoenix, Arizona, in 1981. And the organization realized that I had a statistics and research background, so they asked me to take a part-time job as their data analyst. A veteran therapist there knew that I was in the master's program for counseling and asked if I would be interested in helping her with this children's play group. And I said I would like to do that. She explained that there were a half a dozen children in this group, ages three to seven, and all of them were dealing with abuse of some kind, various levels of extreme, and that she wanted me to pay special attention to this little girl named Marie because she seemed to be having a harder time than most. So I'd had the opportunity to use the things I'd learned working at the preschool at Arizona State University to make a relationship between Marie and myself. I'd pay attention to what she was looking at and how she was reacting, and every once in a while I'd make eye contact and give her a nice smile. I'd treat her very respectfully, and I'd show her the different options she had for colors and, uh, and all the different drawings that she could do, the different activities, but she didn't speak. About session four, she was becoming more animated and involved, making more eye contact and smiling. And at the end of that session, that play therapy session, they were having a sing-along. And all of a sudden, Marie, out of the blue, joined in. So the first sounds I ever heard from this little girl named Marie was of her singing a joyful sound. That touched me. But the message really came home to me. Two weeks later, I was at a street fair in downtown Tempe. And on a crowded sidewalk on that particular day, I heard a small voice behind me. It seemed to be calling my name, but it was a little fuzzy. So I stopped and I turned. And when I did, the crowd parted like the Red Sea. And there was Marie running up the sidewalk her foster parents behind her and her sister, they were walking hand in hand and smiling over the fact that they had surprised me. It was delightful. I got down on one knee and I greeted Marie as she got close. We gave each other a hug and she just talked and talked about all the adventures that they had that morning. All the things they had done, all the things they were going to do, and we just chatted there on that busy sidewalk. As Marie left with her family, she turned around and she waved. Bye, Mr. Kukendall. My name's pronounced Kirkendall, but she called me Mr. Kukendall. And that was precious. I could not turn away. I, I simply could not or would not turn away from what had happened. A transformation moment or time in this little girl's life had happened, and I was a part of it. And nothing else that I had imagined in my future seemed to matter, because I was a part of something that seemed profoundly precious. 
and it has been. For 20 years, I worked delivering direct services to children and families who are victims of sexual abuse, survivors. For the next 14 years, I spent much of my time caregiving the most remarkable survivor of childhood sexual abuse I've ever known. That's my late wife, Carol Jarvis Kirkendall. We were married 28 years. And now, today, I have a daughter that I'm an advocate for also. I provide as good a counseling as I can for her also, because she suffers from many of the same problems her mother did. And we've found joy and peace in our life. It's important that you know that, that there is joy and peace after such horrible, ugly things can happen to a child. I'd like you to imagine now with me that there are children coming down the middle aisle, the, the aisles on the side, a variety of children coming on stage to, to form a line and a little bit of a crowd here facing you. And these are special children to me because these are the children I've worked with or that my wife worked with or that some of my colleagues have worked with. I've known all of these children. And as you see them line up behind me and fan out on both sides behind this chair, I want you to see that there are, pe there are children there for various ages, various races, socioeconomic groups, gender identities, philosophies, religions. Every one of those things are represented here. This is a diverse group of children, and the thing that they all have in common is that they have been or will be sexually abused in their lives. They're a happy-looking group. They know that they're here for me today. The, the, the younger ones are standing in front, the older ones are standing behind, and they're here to show themselves to you. This is a profound profession I've been in for the last 30-some years. It has joys that I had no idea were going to come. In the face of truly ugly things that can happen to children, there is beauty. There is something sacred in this work. And I invite you all to not let the ugly truths of this scare you away from being involved. Some of these children have bounced back very easily, or they're quite resilient, or maybe the abuse was minimal. But some of them are going to struggle all of their life, off and on, with the results of that trauma. Many of them are not going to make it. And that's what the empty chair is about. Some of them are going to die from their injuries soon. Some of them can possibly uh, go off into drug and alcohol abuse, risk-taking behaviors, even suicide. Some of the children don't make it. But these children have. And we celebrate the fact that we're enjoying life together. And after today's presentation, we're all going over to Aunt Rose's house for a celebration of life party, which is a wonderful thing. I'd like to leave you with three important principles or points. One is that there's a commonality of purpose here today. It's Whatever the divisiveness that these children's parents have had due to various demographic groups or races or religions, we all love these children. That's what we have in common across all these other boundaries or borders. We love these children and we want the best for them. That commonality of purpose. I've seen it in therapy more times than I can count. 
families, parents come together to talk about the fact that their children had been sexually abused. And what they discover is that they empathize with each other, that they reach across what would have been boundaries that uh, they couldn't imagine crossing, and they embrace each other in their love for each other's children, and they help each other. This is a powerful dynamic in human relationships. Second, and my word choice is quite deliberate here, sexual abuse of children is predominantly a man-made problem. Man-made problem. There aren't many men working in this industry. Historically, women lead the charge on this issue, on this cause, saving children and giving them services that will help them thrive as children. Too many men are standing on the sidelines, so part of my purpose for being here today is to make a call, call to action for men to get more involved, to partner up with the women who are leading this, this world of saving and helping children who've been sexually abused. We need men in this equation, men who can empathize and be kind and compassionate, who can bring time, energy, money, or political capital to this cause. If you are involved in this industry, this profession, this cause, men, I salute you, I embrace you, I celebrate your contribution. If you're not involved, I want you to know that I embrace you too. You're good men, let's become more involved. Let's make sure that all of these children get the services they need because what we know right now is that the children of privilege are going to get the most services. The brown and the black children aren't going to get as many as the white children. And at the bottom of the scale is probably the red children. We need some equality. We need some services for all of them regardless of all the other parts of our adult equation, we want these children to have a chance at life. That's our commonality of purpose. And third is this. We're in a time, an era, if you will, of chaos and confusion, of deception, and hidden agendas on a national and world scale. Sometimes we don't know what's going to happen next. Sometimes we don't want to watch the news. We, we're at a decisive moment in history. And what I'd like to suggest is this notion that our love of these children can bring us together in a commonality of purpose. That if we partner with other groups that don't look like us or don't sound like us, and we build a relationship on the fact that we love these children and we want them to have a full and happy life, who knows what else we might be able to talk to each other about. We could take this ugly truth and turn it into something profound by talking with each other about how to help them. They're giving me the eye because they know we're close to our big finale. I thank you all for being here and for all of you at home listening. Let us be brave, let's be committed, and let's imagine a world where all these children get their needs met. Are we ready? All right, you remember how we rehearsed it? Okay, let's start our wave. Okay, one, two, Three, 
See you later, alligator.